Good morning. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you here today for the opening session of the 14th North American Meeting of the Catalysis Society. Uh, I would point out to you, don't be afraid to sit out, we're going to project on all three screens simultaneously, so you won't have to crane your neck to see uh, Dr. Davis's talk. <laughs> Just a couple of minor announcements. I want all of the speakers to be aware that we will be re -screen, rear screen projecting in these three rooms during the course of the meeting. That has significant bearing on how you load your slides. And there are instructions in the speaker ready room for doing that properly. But there will be someone in the back if we don't get it right. For those sessions in the superior room, they will be forward projected, and that's just standard, so anybody talking in that room will have nothing more than to load the slides if you ordinarily will. Uh, the copies will be out and up on the next level, near the exhibits, uh, for each break. The superior room is out down a couple of turns, and we're putting signs out, so those who are scheduled to be there or want to be there, we'll be able to find them. I want to reiterate that all society events, including technical sessions, are commissioned by badge only. And the final thing I'm supposed to say this morning is the COCUS award winners who have travel grants coming, who have refunds coming, are to meet Professor Hecker out near the registration area on Thursday at noon. That way you'll get your money back. If you gave money, if you paid before we had all the money allocated, you have every check coming back, that will be available to you then. Now I'd like to introduce the president of your society, Dr. Richard Gonzalez of Tulane University, who will be introducing this morning's eminent lecturer, Dick. Good morning. I'd like to add my words of welcome to the 14th North American meeting. Uh, it's look, it looks to me like we have a tremendous attendance. I understand there are over 1,000 uh, registrants, and I'm sure this is going to be a very productive week for all of us. Uh, speaker Mark Davis received all of his degrees, his bachelor's, Masters, PhD from uh, the University of Kentucky. I'm sure the University of Kentucky can be very proud of. He was a professor of chemical engineering at BPI from 1981 to 1989, later on at Stanford, where he was a visiting professor for one year. And he is currently the Warren and Catherine Slinger Professor at the California Institute of Technology. Mark has won many awards, but I'd just like to stress here the ones that I think are the most important awards. He was the Professional Young Investigator Award from NSF in 1985. Uh, he won the Alan Coburn Award from the AICHE in 1989. He was awarded the Alan T. Waterman Award, NSF. In fact, Mark has done much better than most of us at NSF. Uh, but uh, he was also the first engineer to have won this award. So people have finally recognized that engineers can do good basic science. And now he is the Paul A. Chemet Award winner in Fundamental Catalysis. Mark serves on various ed editorial boards, the Catalysis Letters, the Journal of Catalysis, the AICHE Journal, Microporous Materials, and he's an author or co-author of over 150 papers. That was the last time that I looked at the media. There's a lot more than that now. Mark and his research group have been involved in initiating research in several classes of extra-large pore materials, molecular sieves, and intersecting 12 and 10 ring pore zeolites. These studies have opened broad, new research directions in catalysis throughout the world. More recently, 
Mars group that synthesized a new class of heterogenized organometallic catalysts. There's widespread implications for performing stereoselective liquid phase reactions. A chiral version of this concept has also been reported by Mark. And in this case, the, uh, the new catalyst is clearly synthesized by design, which is what we all have tried to be doing. The title of today's talk that Mark will present will be Shape Selective Catalysis, Past, Present, Present, and Future. But before I bring Mark up, uh, because Mark, unfortunately, has a very pressing need to leave today. I want to present him with the Emmett Award. This is a check. This award is sponsored by the Research Division of W.R. Grace and Company. Mark, would you please? On behalf of the Society, I really want to congratulate you for your outstanding. Well, with that warm introduction, and now that I have the check, I think I'll go home. <laughs> um, what I thought I would do today is to um, talk about shape selective catalysis in general. And, and give you a little bit about my thoughts about where it's been and, and where it's going. So what I'm going to try to do is give a brief history of the field and then talk about um, some of the shape selective catalysis that's on the forefront today and then briefly at the end mention a few things where I think it, it may go. Was and there so, another way that we could dim these lights? I was told that this was going to do it. Oh, for one. Try the next one over. I tried all three of them. It's not functioning. Is there, is there a switch to the master switch? <laughs> now, what I, what I want to do is, is I will weave some of our work into this, but I, I want to make it much broader than the work that we've done. So I just wanted to give you more of the overview. <laughs> and this field is driven by new materials and modification of those materials. So today's presentation is going to be shape selective catalysis more from the materials perspective than the reaction perspective. Now, if you're going to talk about shape selective catalysis, you have to talk about zeolites. The fundamental building blocks for zeolites are oxide, tetrahedra, silicon, and aluminum. And they're uh, connected through bridging oxygens. And whenever you have aluminum atoms in the framework, of course, you have negative charge that have to be balanced by uh, positive cations. The typical ones are alkali metal. And as we know, these crystals are porous, and so uh, they have void space. And if you have a lot of aluminum in the crystals, you have these cations there. And to fill their coordination sphere, they typically grab water. And so what you have when you have a zeolite that has a lot of aluminum then, it is an, it's a very hydrous material because it has all the water in it. It's crystalline, and it's aluminum silicate. Now, the real advantage of, of these materials, of course, is the fact that they are crystals. And so these pore sizes that are in these crystals are absolutely uniform but you're not going to get in an amorphous material. But the key issue is not only are they uniform, but the other caveat that must go along with that is, is that this pore size is on the size of small molecules. So the fact that it's uniform and also in the range of small molecules makes these materials useful for a variety of applications that would involve molecular discrimination of small molecules. And Primarily, they've been used in the petrochemical industry where we are talking about a variety of, of, of molecules in the range of 10 angstroms and below. Now, I really like this slide because it illustrates two of the three major uses of zeolites. And this is from, from Ian Maxwell and Bill Stork. This is the shell total isomerization process. And what you have is a feed stream of paraffins come over the first step, you do an isomerization over a zeolite catalyst, the mordenite. Then you use another zeolite, zeolite A, to separate the unreacted linear paraffins from the branch paraffins for the recycling. So you can upgrade the research octane number by about 20 points in this process. 
And it nicely illustrates both catalysis and separation. The third, of course, is ion exchange. And so today we're going to concentrate on catalysis. And so if you're going to talk about shape selective catalysis, really the first real example of this, the first clear example started with the first issue of the Journal of Catalysis. If you look back, this was in 1962. It was a paper by Paul Weiss and colleagues at Mobile. Very clear example of shape selective catalysis. Essentially, they used two zeolites, um, calcium X, calcium A, and the reaction they were looking at was the dehydration of alcohols to alkenes. So for example, in, in calcium X, the pore size is 7.5 angstroms. When you try to react both iso or normal alcohol, you can see from the top two lines that there's really no discrimination between those two. But if you go to a zeolite, the pore size is very close to one of the sizes of the reactants. So for example, when you go to zeolite A, the pore size is a little over 4 angstroms. You can selectively absorb the linear alcohol, but not the iso alcohol. So at 250 degrees C, you can get almost complete discrimination between too. And this really was the, the first clear example of shape selective catalysis, and we've, we've seen many, many more examples since then. Well, there is a variety of different types of shape selective catalysis, and the classic reference for this is from Cicere at Chevron, 1984, where he tried to categorize the types of selectivity seen to that time into three categories reactant, product, and transition state. So these are fairly obvious, as you might expect. It's the reactant-induced shape selectivity as you're discriminating between the size of different reactant molecules. Those that go in react, those that don't go by. In product selectivity, you're using a zeolite that has a cavity in it. So this has to be something more than a one-dimensional zeolite. And you're creating a variety of products that all can equilibrate between one another within the voids of the zeolite one or at least one of the products has a smaller kinetic diameter than the other, so the diffusion coefficient of that uh, molecule is much higher than the others. So you selectively sieve out one of the components, although all of the components are actually made within the crystal. And the most difficult to prove, as you might expect, is transition state selectivity, where again you're talking about steric constraints that don't allow the reaction coordinate to go through a particular transition state. And I'd like to illustrate just very briefly these three points because it then leads into other things. So the, the Weiss example was a solid acid. The other thing that's used with zeolites is, is that there's a host that you put some kind of occluded species in there to do the catalysis. So here's an example of occluded metals. It's an interesting example from Japan out of Osaka where essentially they, they built the rhodium-6 CO16 cluster in sodium Y by a technique we published in the mid-80s. The interesting point is then they were able to decarbonylate completely the CO to make these very small particles of, of rhodium inside the zeolite. We proved it by x axis experiments. And interestingly, what we we're saying here then is, is that you have one cavity out of about 10 to 20 that you have this rhodium particle in, so you still have a lot of void space for reactants and products to move. The, the, the particle what appears is the cartoon is my racquetball inside of the phagocyte. And so you, you can still get good fluxes of material in and out, but you can still have the zeolite to do the shape selectivity, to do the discrimination. And they showed very nice results for liquid phase hydrogenation. On the left is rhodium on carbon, just to show you that the two olefins, the, the C6 and the C12, both react at these conditions. The right shows you that you get complete discrimination um, over the rhodium inside the, the zeolite. It's really quite a nice example of reactant induced shape selectivity. You go to the other extreme, the classic example is the formation of paraxylene, where here you're, you're uh, either the isomer or the disproportionation of toluene or the alkylation of toluene. You go either way, you're making all of the xylene isomers, but the paraxylene on modified ZSN5 has a diffusion coefficient orders of magnitude higher than, than ortho meta, and so you selectively sieve out the paraxylene. Uh, again, please note this is on modified ZSN5. Parent ZSN5 doesn't give you this discrimination. Now, the problem is, and you cut off the top, but when you're, you're talking about transition state selectivity, this is a very hard thing to prove. But one thing's for sure when you do product selectivity, which is what got cut off at the top, that if you go to larger crystals, you can enhance this product um, shape selectivity because you really want to be in a diffusion limited regime to take advantage of these ratio to diffusion coefficients. So there, you will see differences when you go with different crystal sizes. 
But if you're doing real transition state selectivity, this is not going to be a function of the crystal size. And this, so this is one of the signatures that you can use to try to probe transition state selectivity. You're, you're doing it at, again, trying to cut down um, which types of transition states the fraction pathway can go through, and it's going to be independent of crystal size. But one example that I find interesting to illustrate this, if you want to go and look at it, is, is some Russian work that came out in Catalysis Letters, where they used both Mordenite and ZSF5. Um, they absorbed dienes into the system at low temperature, and then heated up and followed the reaction by EPR spectroscopy. And what you see is in Mordenite that, that you get cyclization, and ZSF5 you don't, where if you take the products the cyclized products they absorb into these materials. So clearly here what you're seeing is uh, transition state selectivity of the uh, cyclic intermediate. But this is a very hard one to prove, but I think this is actually one of the ones that we need to go to in the future, is to go to trying to design transition state selectivity. Now, those were primary shape selectivity, and those are common. Um, there's also what's called secondary shape selectivity. There's different types of categories of this. Um, one type is uh, when you see shape selective behavior that's modified by the addition of another component into the system. So something other than the reactants or the products, if you put it in there on purpose. There are numerous examples of this, and of course this would never happen in an unrestricted environment, only in restricted environments. Um, one nice example by uh, Don Santilli at, at Chevron, uh, where when you add N-hexane, it inhibits the cracking of N-hexadecane on a zeolite called SSC16. Some work out of Japan, where they add now a bigger molecule that dibranch butane retards the cracking of N-octane on ZC5. And some work by D.J. John at, at Tulane, uh, dealing with adding in aromatics also to inhib excuse me, <coughs> inhibit some uh, uh, hydrocracking reactions. In each case, what you're doing is you're modifying the pore space during the reaction conditions by having a molecule that doesn't participate in the reaction go along with the reactants and products. And finally, uh, another one I just want to point out, which is a very interesting example, but very recent, again from Santilli and, and uh, co-workers at Chevron. Is when we talk about all of this shape selective uh, behavior so far, we're talking about repulsive forces. We're talking about steric interactions between the zeolite framework and the, and the guest molecule. But you can also have attractive forces here. And, and it's actually these attractive forces that are used to assemble zeolites during the synthesis mechanism. The same thing can happen in adsorption and catalysis. And uh, although you can't read this at the bottom of the slide, I'm sure of that, especially in the back, what they show very nicely is not only for adsorption, but for um, cracking, that if you have small pore zeolites, the amount of dye branched uh, paraffins is very low, either for the adsorption or for the products of the cracking. And this, again, is steric. But if you go to larger and larger pore sizes, what you find is you go to a maximum. So if you go to too large in pore size, then you go back down in the amount of dye branch uh, molecules that you make. And this maximum, of course, is occurring at a, at a linear pore where you're maximizing the, the van der Waals interactions between all these dye branch molecules and the zeolites. And so, as we all know, biology teaches us that a lot of weak interactions can do some pretty interesting things. And so what you're seeing here is you're seeing the, a lot of weak interactions stabilizing these molecules if you get the pore size just right relative to the molecule size. And it, this is really kind of an interesting new way to think about things in zeolites. Now, that was a brief history of, of where it's been. And, it, and in my mind, there was a fundamental change in this field in the, in the early 80s when workers at Union Carbide uh, came out with non-silica-based crystalline molecular sieves, or the ALPOs. And what you're doing here is instead of having silicon and aluminum in the zeolite, you have aluminum and phosphorus. And now what you're creating, again, is some very nice structures. These are, are now silica-free and a, quite a wide variety. So if you look at pure silicon dioxide, it, it is a neutral material if it's defect-free. A zeolite, of course, is an anionic framework as you dope in aluminum. But the alpos are the three five analogs of silicon dioxide, so they're neutral. So there's not much you can do with a neutral material as far as catalysis. But of course, as you start to dope in other elements, for example, silicon, you can make these things negative again. And so there's a, a very broad range of materials that now are silicon free. And, and these materials did at least three things, in, in my mind. Um, 
there, there was about three different uh, new thoughts that, that, that I can think are directly related to the fact that, that these materials were synthesized. And the first one, of course, is there was a lot of new materials that came out with a lot of interesting properties. So you might ask, has anybody ever commercialized this for any chemical reactions? And the answer is yes. The first commercialization of a phosphate-based catalyst was by Chevron. Uh, in lube de-waxing, if you're interested, there's a paper by Steve Miller that came out just uh, last fall that describes this. It's a platinum on SAPO 11. So the first thing was, yes, there were new structures with new properties, and people are taking advantage of those. The second was, if you look to the mineralogy literature, it was known that there were natural phosphate materials that created structures that had large void spaces. This is a material called cacoxinite. It's an iron aluminum hydroxy phosphate. Paul Moore at Chicago solved this structure and it showed that it had a cavity here of about 14 angstroms. And so many people are, have been trying to make larger porous enolites, but there was actually models in, in the mineralogical literature with phosphates to make large pores. And so this was actually one of the models that we used in the early 80s to say that we should be looking at phosphate chemistry to try to make large pore molecular sieves. And in fact, um, we were able to do this. Um, uh, uh, a lady named Consuelo Montes first synthesized BPI-5 in our lab. And again, it's a phosphate-based material. Um, and it has a pore size between 12 and 13 angstroms. And this pore size opened up two things. Um, first of all, the absorption and ability to do catalysis on, on larger molecules. Just let me illustrate here through the absorption the fact that you can take in larger molecules. If you look to the first column, alpha 11 is a smaller core material. And you can see the molecular discrimination between cyclohexane and neopentane. If you go to the larger core, alpha 5, you can see the discrimination between neopentane and triisopropyl benzene. And then when you look to BPI 5, it absorbs all of these compounds and larger ones. But what another interesting feature that came out of this that we didn't think about in the beginning was the fact that if you look at the capacity, say for oxygen through neopentane on alpha 5, you see the capacity is constant. And if you look at BPI 5, it monotonically decreases with increasing molecular size. And it took us a while to figure out what was going on here. But essentially what happened is, is when you go to um, molecular sieves now with pores of this size, for the first time, you have to deal with molecular packing issues. Um, for example, with argon, if you have pore sizes below nine angstroms, essentially you're going to put argon atoms in, in, in single file, whereas the case for most molecules in molecular sieves. But with VPI-5, it was the first time that you could actually form a monolayer. So you form a monolayer and then you fill in with, with argon on top of that. And so not only now when you go over 10 angstroms do you have to deal with uh, bigger molecules, but when you're even doing smaller molecules and catalysis on smaller molecules, you can get very interesting packing arrangements here that you couldn't get in smaller versions. And the question is, where has it gone since VPI-5? What I've tried to do here is illustrate where the materials have, have gone from that time. On the right, you see the zeolites that have been around for quite a while and their pore sizes. In 1982, the elbows were announced, so you see a couple of them there. In 88, we came out with BPI-5. Since then, there are numerous other large core materials that have come out, materials like chlorite and, and uh, JDF-20, et cetera. But what I've done here is, is that the shaded portion of the bar graph shows you what has been shown to be the pore size by absorption. And unfortunately, to this day, although crystallographic dimensions have gone up higher than BPI-5, there hasn't been any absorption um, kinetic diameters of the pore size that's higher than BPI-5. So today, we're still limited to about, oh, between 12 and 12 and a half angstroms is the maximum pore size. But what I want to point out is, is that all of these materials that are coming with extra large pores are all phosphate-based materials. There is no zeolite yet um, that have these extra large pores. And this is fascinating to me because I, I don't see any fundamental reason why this should be, but um, it just seems to be coming. And we keep, we keep getting more of these extra large pore phosphates year after year after year. So you might ask, well, wh what do these do for us at this point? Well, we were interested in catalysis. And there's been numerous examples now with BPI-5. There haven't been examples with the other extra large pore materials both liquid phase reactions and vapor phase reactions. But 
in my mind, there's two fundamental limitations to MPI-5 if I were thinking about trying to commercialize it. First of all, the stability is not high relative to zeolite. This is something you'd have to worry about, the rigors of having a real uh, operating material. The second is that for most phosphates, when you add silicon to, to make Bronsted acid sites, these acid sites are not as strong as you see in zeolites. And so for many of the applications that you would like to have, very large pores, you'd like to have strong acidity, uh, this is probably not a viable approach. And so there's still one of the holy grails among the synthetic community is to try to make a very large pore um, zeolite. Now, the, the third thing that came up in my mind immediately when these phosphates came up is can we now do shape selective base catalysis? And as you're all aware, it's shape selective acid catalysis and, and metal acid catalysis, bifunctional and zeolites, have, have had enormous success. The question would be now, can we take base catalysis, which there's lots of it, and do the same thing? Can we get to, to shape-selective base catalysis? And the, the reason this came up is that if you think about this now, if we have um, silicate materials, they're neutral. Aluminum silicates are negative. The alpos are, are also neutral. Now if you'd say, well, what if I take phosphorus and put it together with silicon? Now I would have a positive framework. And so if I have a positive framework, then you could have OH as the, as the anion, and, and you could think about having now an anion exchanger or a solid base catalyst. And this would be really quite exciting to do shape-selective base catalysis. And there were really no crystalline uh, microporous silico phosphates, which still is not, uh, at the time, but there were silicon aluminum phosphorus materials that uh, Unicarbide had published. And so these were nice models to try to understand the bonding to see if silicon and phosphorus really liked each other. And so in the mid 80s, we looked at about 20 different materials that spanned the, the chemical range between alpos, the ternaries, all the way up to pure silica over a variety of different structures, trying to understand the bonding between those the oxides of those three elements. And uh, today, all I want to do is just tell you what the bottom line was. And just for example, what we had to do is for each material is to understand the atomic arrangement of those three elements over the, the topology of the material. So for example, one of them was SAPLA 37, which was the phagocyte structure. It was done mainly through solid state NMR techniques, but with a lot of other characterizations to help out. And in each case, what we were trying to say is we know the topology from X-ray diffraction, and then what we had to do is identify what the atomic ordering was over that topology to see who was next to whom. And um, the bottom line that came out of this work was that silicon doesn't like phosphorus. <coughs> what happens is, is that all, all these materials, silicon is either surrounded by silicon or it's surrounded by aluminum. And of course, this is all through bridging oxygen. And phosphorus is always surrounded by aluminum. Uh, there, there is no uh, exception to these rules. And so the question is why? Because if this is actually true, then it would say that we could never make a silicophosphate framework. And actually, we had to turn back to a, a, a former Caltecher um, and look at some, some early papers. And it, it actually turns out that at least part of the story is, is a very simple answer that goes all the way back to some of Linus Pauling's early rules. Uh, basically by looking simply at, at, at bond valence considerations. And so if you do this, uh, if you look at silicon itself, silicon dioxide, you can see that the, the bond strength on the oxide in the lattice is 2, as you would expect. If you go to an aluminosilicate, it's less than 2. The remaining uh, bond strength is going to be taken up by the balancing cation. If I go now to the 3,5 analog, the alpo, again, the bond strength on the oxygen is 2, as you would expect. But what happens if I put tetrahedral phosphorus next to tetrahedral silicon? You see, this just doesn't work out. And what you would predict would happen is, is that silicon would now go octahedral. And I don't know how many of you have dealt with silicon oxide chemistry, but octahedral silicon at atmospheric pressure is extremely rare. It's only observed in high pressure materials that come out of the, the mantle of the earth. And so this, this prediction would say that if you tried to do this, you would get um, octahedral silicon. Well, since we never observed this, this, this is still very, you feel very uneasy about the fact that, that all it makes sense, you can rationalize it, but you never really have any confirming experiments. 
And it wasn't really until this paper came out in 91 that I was fully convinced that this, this was the correct way to think about it. And I'm sure these people didn't realize what they had done. It was just a, a paper on solid state NMR of glasses. And what they noticed was when you have an aluminum and, and silicon glass, that both aluminum and silicon were tetrahedral. When you made an aluminum phosphate glass, they were both aluminum and phosphorus were tetrahedral. And when they made a silicon and phosphorus glass, the amazing thing was even at, at room pressure, they saw octahedral low, um, silicon, just as you would predict. This, this was very, very nice. So what you were seeing was phase-separated silica that was tetrahedral. And at the, the interface between the silica and the phosphorus, you saw the octahedral silicon and the tetrahedral phosphorus. And the instant that you put aluminum back into the system, that now when you have the ternary, all of them are tetrahedral again. And the fact that the chemical shifts for all of these environments were exactly what we see in the crystalline materials gives you faith that you're looking at the same kind of chemistry. So I think these are very clear proof that, that uh, this is a very strong argument against ever having a positive framework. And so if I were betting, I would bet that we're never going to see a positive framework to be able to have the framework itself um, be the solid base catalyst. I can't find any combination of elements that wouldn't violate these rules. Well, you shouldn't give up and say on base catalysis, it's too important. So know, fortunately, another man in our lab in the mid 80s, Paul Atwood, came up with the idea, well, we couldn't do it with the framework itself. Let's play the other trick that everybody plays with zeolite catalysis. Let's just let it be the host. And let's build a guest in there that we know is, is a base. And so in his case, he decided to take cesium oxides, potassium oxides, which we know are good solid bases. And so what he did was to build little clusters of oxides now, not metals, inside of zeolites. And just to show you that it is this cluster that, that's the catalytically active species, here's some results that we have for one butane conversion and CO2 TPD. And what you're seeing now is this, when you make, make the zeolite, um, you ion exchange the zeolite first with cesium to take away all the ion exchange sites, and then you build this cluster in. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at the amount of extra cesium other than ion exchange. And you can see that the activity tracks very nicely with this extra cesium, not the ion exchange cesium. Also with the CO2 desorption. It goes through a maximum because you just build a particle up so high that you're, you're having the classic dispersion effects that you see with metals as well. But the question was, and, and uh, when we first published this, people were very skeptical about the fact that we had actually made cesium oxide in here. There were many candidates to try to rule out here as what is this active site. But after quite a few years of work, it's pretty clear that, that it is cesium oxide. It's a very small particle of cesium oxide. And the question is, just like with metals, um, especially as, as you've seen from Bruce Case recently, when this metal particle gets down to where we only have a couple of atoms, it's a very interesting character. It's not like a little piece of the bulk. Well, what we have is the same thing here with oxides. This is not like bulk cesium oxide. And one way to show you this is, is if you look at the cesium solid state NMR on the right, is the chemical shift for cesium in bulk CS2O is 225 parts per million. If you look at the cesium in the zeolite, the minus 175 is actually the ion exchange cesium. And for the, the particles, what you're seeing is minus 125. So it's an enormous difference in chemical environment. So this is not like bulk cesium oxide in any stretch of the imagination. So the question would be is, is if it's not like bulk cesium oxide, can you do some interesting chemistry that can't be done with bulk cesium oxide? And one example is out of Hattori's lab in Japan, where they followed our synthetic methodology and showed that for one butene isomerization, over this cesium oxide uh, nanoparticle material, you can in fact run this reaction very efficiently even at zero degrees C, where uh, both CS2O uh, is not catalytic at these conditions. And so um, this shows you that there is quite a bit of difference, and this is not due to uh, surface area effects. They took that into account. But I wanted to point out one very interesting piece of chemistry that came out of this, and this is due to, to workers at Merck. Um, where they were trying to find a new route to this molecule at the top of the slide, the uh, MT, which is uh, one of the two building blocks that they used to make the fungicide that's shown at the bottom. And um, how they're doing it now is, is this chemistry here. Um, it's a series of reactions. 
not, not too clean, but, but gets the job done. The idea was to see if you could make a catalytic process go to this. And uh, it turned out that Bortzman and coworkers at, at Merck used this idea of over-exchange of, of making these zeolite catalysts where you now have, uh, in addition to the ion exchange sites, you have this extra amount of cesium oxide there with the zeolite, show that you could run this reaction in one step very efficiently. And so this, this is a very elegant piece of work that uh, hopefully someday will we'll get commercialized. Uh, but it's, it's very nice and shows uh, some of the, the power of trying to go to uh, zeolites for basic analysis. And so if you look at the history here, it, it's very young, but it's moving very quickly. Um, not only uh, the work in our group, but also Tom Brownskin and colleagues at, at Shell have about 15 patents in this area now uh, for a variety of different materials and chemistries. Uh, the Japanese group is very active. The Berg group is active, and also a group in France. It's been extended away from alkali metals to alkaline earth clusters. All of these top two categories have been involved with base catalysis in a variety of different reactions. And um, also some very interesting work out of Amico now, where you're making mixed metal oxides. And this is a work of you that first came out in 93 and is continuing through today. This is used for oxidation. And so uh, I'm on my soapbox a little bit today saying that uh, now trying to build uh, metal oxides and mixed metal oxides I think is a very good area uh, for future work in zeolite catalysis. It's young, but we're, we're seeing a lot of very interesting chemistries come out already, but there are very, very many things to do. Sir. Now, where I'm at, I'm, I'm in the middle of this trying to tell you where we're at at present. Um, there's been work on metals, on metals with acid sites, with bifunctional, this is traditional zeolite catalysis. Hopefully I've convinced you there is, there is exciting opportunities in, in depositing metal oxides inside of zeolites. We've talked about acid catalysis, but the one other big uh, breakthrough in the zeolite area over the last decade has been doing oxidation chemistry where the oxidation site is part of the lattice. And so I'd like to finish off this section on zeolite catalysis at present with that. And of course, for those of you that are familiar with this area, this is TS1. Um, th this is a revolutionary material in my mind. It stands for titanium silicolite 1. It's pure silicon zeosin fiber. A small amount of the silicon now has been replaced by titanium. This material is, is absolutely spectacular for many aspects. First of all, it can perform all of these oxidation chemistries. Same catalyst. And these oxidations are going in high selectivities and high yields fairly high turnover frequencies. The generality here is enormous. It's, it's just absolutely incredible. And the top reaction, the phenol reaction is commercialized. The bottom reaction to the oxine is, is commercialized. The oxidation is close to being commercialized. And there are, it, this was all by any in Italy. But there's numerous countries or companies throughout the world, including the United States, that are, are fairly far along for their chemistries with TS1. You're going to see a lot more process chemistry coming from this one particular material. The other interesting thing about it is, is that this chemistry is going with aqueous hydrogen peroxide. And for those of you who have ever done any titanium chemistry, this should be a big shock to you. That how in the world can this titanium survive in the presence of all of this water? This is really one of the critical issues that uh, most people were flabbergasted by this when it first came out. For those of you that are familiar with the shell epoxidation process, of course, you know it's rigorously anhydrous. Or, say, for example, the Sharpless reaction, you can't have water there either. So this was a critical issue. And so we, we tried to at least look into here to, to add a, a few comments about what are some of the critical features of the material. Let me just illustrate some points over the next two slides. What we did is made a series of materials and characterized them well. And what we have is you go from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. The top of the slide, the titanium in that material is entirely within the framework. And as you move down the slide, we have increasing amounts of titanium that is not in the framework. And the bottom one has no titanium in the framework. It's all extra framework. And for the epoxidation reaction, what you find is that you can still run the reaction. You must have framework titanium to run the epoxidation reaction. But any extra framework titanium hurts you in the fact that your hydrogen peroxide goes to dioxygen. And so if you don't have isolated titanium, which was 
was uh, commented on by the Enning group, that when you get titanium, at least in pairs or, or bigger nuclearity, then you can take peroxide to die oxygen. So you, you essentially don't want to have any extra freedom of titanium or you're going to lose on your peroxide. And we were able to, to verify that quite nicely in this set of experiments. So the key issue is that you need to have isolated titanium four in the framework to run the partial oxidation. You don't want to have extra framework titanium, you're just going to blow off your peroxide. Now the coordination, of course, is changing during the catalytic cycle, so that's not important. But the question is, again, how can this operate in the presence of water? This, this is very intriguing. And the question is, it turns out that this high silicon ZSC5 is one of the very rare zeolites that's hydrophobic. And was this an important clue? key to this. Just to show you what I have here is adsorption is isotherms, the adsorption desorption at the top of nitrogen at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And this shows you what the void volume of that crystal is, although I, I left off the axis on here. The adsorption amount is in, in milliliters of liquid per gram, and, and the x-axis is the, the relative pressure, P over P0. So you can see the capacity is quite high, but then when you try to do a water adsorption, you can see that the material is hydrophobic. And so we really wanted to test for this. So what we did is we looked both at the, the alkane oxidation and the epoxidation reaction for a, an amorphous titanosilicate as well as PS1. And these were done at low conversion on purpose because we wanted to look at the initial rates of reaction. And so if you look at the third column, you're seeing that for TS1, both with the oxidation and epoxidation, it doesn't matter whether there's water present or not for TS1. But then when you look at the amorphous material, um, when we say anhydrous peroxide, it's anhydrous starting peroxide plus a water sponge to suck up any of the water that's formed from the peroxide. And you have to do all of this to be able to make these things active at all. And what you find is, yes, that they are active. You get the same selectivities that you get on TS1 when there is absolutely no water in the system. As soon as the water is in the system, you get no active. They get very, very little activity. So yes, this hydrophobicity is, is a major key. Um, another set of interesting experiments along the same line of thought was by Tatsumi at Tokyo. He did the same thing that we did. So he took two different materials, TS1 and the amorphous material. But now what he did is he reacted unfunctionalized and functionalized open and showed they both reacted the same on TS1, but on the amorphous material, the unsaturated alcohol reacted. And so their conclusion was is that, again, you get water on the surface of the amorphous material because it's hydrophilic. And now if you make an olefin that can penetrate that water layer and get to the titanium, it's still active. So it's not the fact that the water is coordinating to the titanium and staying strongly bonded to titanium. It's the fact that the water is blocking the, the substrate from getting to the titanium in the first place. And so if you can get around that issue, you can still make it, make it active. And so if you look at the essential features of what makes TS1 go, is that you have a high number density of isolated titanium atoms. And these are exposed to the reaction bar. This gives you high reaction rates and very high peroxide efficiencies. Uh, it's located in a hydrophobic environment. So what's happening is that, first of all, you're not sieving in bulk water. And the water that you're forming by the peroxide reaction is easily displaced by the hydrophobic substrates that are coming in. So as the substrate comes in, it's displacing this water back out of the bulk solution. So the titanium can remain very active. And this shouldn't surprise you if you've looked at any metalloenzyme work, you're seeing the same thing. This is exactly the same trick that a lot of these methane monooxygenases and hydroxylases uses, that they sieve in the hydrocarbon, they react it to the alcohol, and then the alcohol is displaced back out into the water. It's the same concept. And so if you're going to move on to other titanium zeolites, I think this hydrophobicity issue is something to, to worry about. So you want to have this hydrophobicity in any other uh, material you're trying to make. Now the problem is, as I said, that the selectivities were pretty much the same as titanium on, on the uh, amorphous material. But there's one caveat here that nobody understands at this point that is very unique to this chemistry. Is that if you look at alkane oxidation by a variety of different systems, say the FEN system or the GIF system, the TS1 chemistry doesn't conform to any of these. It conforms more closely to radical type chemistry, except for one issue. On TS1, you get absolutely no primary CH activation. None. It's not that it's small, it's zero. And it's zero for a very broad range of, of substrates. 
So there's something very unusual about this chemistry, and, and I don't think anybody really understands this at this point. Uh, it, it may be a detriment for a lot of the cases that you'd like to use it for, but it's clear that it holds up for all substrates that have been tested so far. There doesn't seem to be any terminal CH bond activation. And so this, this is still a, an area of the, uh, intense study to try to find out why. Well, I've, I've been kind of long-winded on, on these different types of, of uh, shape selectivity at this point. I'd like to finish up in the last uh, 10 minutes or so by talking about what I think some of the areas of the future are here. And clearly, some of the new directions is now everybody likes to use this buzzword design. And I'm as guilty as anybody of using it a lot. Um, can we make new structures by design? Can we make what we want? Some targets, as I mentioned to you, is trying to make large pore zeolites. And um, can we get into chirality? This is the one area of chemistry that hasn't been explored with zeolite chemistry. The other is, we'd like to be able to make these structures that we know, that known, but we'd like to put the catalytically active agents exactly where we'd like them. So for example, let's not have a random distribution of aluminum anymore. Let's put aluminum in one crystallographic site so we can fix the acidity very precisely. Can we do this through synthetic methodology such that we, we have these very uniform catalytic sites? So what I'd like to do is just give you a few slides about where, where these two areas are right now and where they're going. Now I want to come back to this example by Santilli Harrison Zones because there, there are very few targets that people have put out for us synthetic people to shoot at. And this is a great target because if what they're saying is if you can make a pore size around seven to eight angstroms, but we want to do it in multi-dimensions, we could really come up with a very, very nice hydrocracking catalyst that would give a lot of die branch. And so this is telling us where we want to be synthetically. The question is, how do we attack a problem like this? Well, we're going to attack it by a concept called structure direction and synthesis of these materials, which is illustrated by this cartoon by Zone. The idea is to use an organic molecule to organize the inorganic material around it to make this composite structure with the right topology that you want, and then to burn out the organic. Now, the, the whole idea of structure direction has been questioned by many, but over the last, oh, eight years or so, we worked very hard, uh, both at BPI and Caltech, along with, with Stacey, to understand this crystallization mechanism. And it's absolutely clear now that in fact these organic molecules do organize silicates around themselves to form these enclathrated species. We've now detected them by in situ NMR techniques. We've now trapped them and collected them. So there's no doubt they exist. And so that's where we have to attack this problem. We have to attack it at the molecule level, trying to say we want to build a molecule the way we want it to, to build us the pore architecture that we'd like. <clears throat> Is it possible to do that? Yes, here's an interesting example from Stacy. It was known that that linear diquat at the top could make one-dimensional linear pores. So if you think about it, it's like a, a hot dog. You have an axis of rotation down the middle of the molecule, and then you're going to make a one-dimensional channel. So what Stacy thought is if I add another ring to that, I break symmetry, so I can't have a linear channel anymore. I should have an intersecting pore system of a particular size based on the size of that organic. And, uh, a man in my lab named Raul Lobo helped him work this out. Uh, in fact, they solved the crystal structure, and in fact, it was just as they predicted that you had a multi-dimensional material uh, that was forced by this molecule having this tricyclic uh, configuration. And so here, clearly what you're seeing is, yes, we can form four systems of dimensionalities by fixing the molecule. And so the question would be to fix the molecule with a particular size and shape that you want to go after for this hydrocracking example from Chevron, and that would be a, a logical way to approach this problem. The other chirality, let me tell you about where we're at here. This is a real tough one, as you, as you might expect. The model system is zeolite beta. Beta is an inner growth of two types of polymorphs, polymorph A and B, that was identified by John Newsom and colleagues. Polymorph A actually is, uh, has a, a handedness to it. So John and his colleagues here, might a nice uh, simulation of what would happen. The beta is actually a 50, or about a 50-50 mixture of these two structures. But if you go to the one in the bottom left, that's polymorph A. 
we know what the x-ray pattern should look like from John. We never made this material pure, but this material actually is, has two enantiomers. And if you look at it, it's chiral because it has a helical channel. And so the two enantiomers are the left-handed helical seed and the right-handed helical seed. So the, what you'd want to do is, is not only get to polymorphase, but you'd want to make one of the enantiomers the polymorphase. So you've got two, two issues to deal with here. But of course, how you would attack this problem is to create one of these organic molecules that would not only structure direct to polymorphase, but in itself would be chiral. Now, some early work that was done in our laboratories by a man named Juan Rancid um, told us that it's possible to do this. Okay? And this is just telling us if we think it's possible. At the top is the x-ray pattern of normal beta. In the middle is the simulated pattern. Uh, predicted from, from Lucent's work of what polymorphe would look like if we ever made it. It wouldn't tell us whether it's racemic or not, but that's what polymorphe would be. At the bottom is actually a sample that was prepared by one using a chiral organic agent. And you can see, well, maybe you can't see because it's so small, but what we're doing is in this sample we have pushed the fraction of, of polymorphe away from the 50 50 mixture with polymorph B. The question was, was this extra polymorph A chiral or not? can't test that by diffraction, so we returned to a chemical reaction to test it. So what we did is we looked at this uh, ring opening reaction, where if you open that uh, epoxide, it could go to a variety of diodes, and we wanted to see if there was any chirality induced into the product. And in fact, there was, okay? You, you, you might laugh at this low ED, I know. It, it's, it's low, but I want to caution you that the first organometallic uh, antial selective results were at about 10% EE, and then moving from that point, it's actually a commercial process now, at, at over 90% EE. Here we have a very small fraction of this poly, an enhancement of the polymorphase. There is some chirality to this sample because you can get um, some EE in the product, and also what you can do is take a racemic mixture of the diol itself and do an absorption experiment, and once again, you do see an EE from the product, so there is slight enhancement. Now, People would sneeze at this. I would too. But what it says is, from a synthetic point of view, it tells us that it's, it's feasible. It's still a very long way to go. And the methodology we were using here, we have not been able to extend it. That's why it's been a year or so since we put this out. We have not gone much further. We've had to develop all new synthetic methodology to get back to this problem. And, and we're now back uh, hard at it again with, with a, a new way of going at it, with a variety of, of chiral templates. Now, I'd be remiss if I were to say we're talking about design of, of solid catalysts and to just talk about zeolites. Right? There are other things out there. And this is one that caught a lot of attention last year. It was a paper by Hamann and Meyer that talked about templating silica, especially in Europe. There's a lot of activity in this right now. So the idea was to look at what happens in catalytic antibody technology is to try to develop a transition state analog template to template the silica, take it out, and then can you run that reaction that you templated for? In this case here, they were looking at the transesterification reaction. So they postulated the transition state that, that's shown in the middle of the slide and created the transition state analog uh, on the right of the middle of the slide. They then attached a silicon alkoxide to this transition state analog and then made a silicon glass with this, this um, transition state analog was incorporated into the glass. Then they removed the transition state analog, and some of the phosphorus was left behind to create the acid site to run the reaction. And in this little note that they claimed that they were getting this um, reaction to proceed, well, we've spent a year looking at this problem. And in fact, uh, the reaction does proceed, but it doesn't proceed because it's templated at all. In fact, you can get the reaction to proceed on the silica prepared in the same way without the template. It turns out that in these synthesis conditions, you can make microporous um, amorphous silica. And so what we're finding is, is these reactions are just occurring because of the microporosity, not because of any templating effect that's going on. And interestingly, last month, the, the same group came out with a, a paper on a different reaction where they claim, ah, once again, we tried to imprint silica, but we can't ever prove that the catalysis is due to the imprinted cavity. So this, although it's very exciting conceptually, um, still is not a proven concept. Uh, this, this is something people have wanted to see for a long time, even since the Linus Pauling work back at Caltech in the 50s. Uh, 
but, but no one has a successful example of this at this time. So what I'd like to do is summarize here for you the types of templated materials that you see in the literature and, and where the, the good points and the bad points. I hope, hope you can see this in the back, it's a little small. The top of the heap is catalytic antibodies. You know, the Lerner, Schultz, Silver work. These are successful. Uh, you see rate enhancements up to eight orders of magnitude due to the catalytic antibody. You can do enantioselective reactions. The potential is high for continued use of these for the design of running reactions via catalytic antibody. Disadvantages, of course, are the preparation methods. They are homogeneous. Um, and the fact that the, the, the robustness, you think about a variety of industrial reactions, uh, these are some of the problems that you're going to run into with going into this technology. There's been a, a whole series of works done by Wolf, Mosbach, Shea, Seligrin, and other players in this game in trying to template polymers. Uh, this was primarily for adsorption, and there has been an antioselective separation on these polymers, but these, this group of people now is trying to get into catalysis, and you're seeing some catalysis come out in 94 and 95. Now, the rate enhancements are abysmal. Okay, they're you know, maybe one or two turnovers all right, over a period of a week. The, the rates are extremely low. I mean, some of the quoted turnovers are, we get 80 turnovers in, in uh, seven days, okay, things like this. Um, have they shown an antioselectivity? Yes, very low. So that's why I rank the potential here as modest. Okay. I think one of the critical issues here is the active site density is a problem. The flexibility of the polymer is also a problem as far as trying to build in precise selectivities. And once again, the robustness issue as far as regeneration. But right now, I would say that the real key issue as far as catalysis is the turnovers. If you look through the imprinted silicas, there's been a variety of, of papers that come out of Japan, the so-called footprint catalysis, as well as Myers right now in template silica. Once again, the enhancement in rate on these is very low. Uh, in our hands, when we reproduce the Meyer work, we get an enhancement of less than, than 10 over background here. So we get the, almost a 40% enhancement of the background rate. So it's, it's again, very abysmal. Uh, there's no proven antioselectivity at this point. And again, this, this problem of uh, active site density is a problem. Robustness. We all know what happens to an amorphous oxide as you try to regenerate this thing over and over again. And if you're trying to build in a very precise cavity with amorphous material, the chances are that cavity is going to change with time, even with the time force of the reaction. With silica, you've got a high potential that it's going to be changing. The zeolites, I showed you the one example of the nantial selectivity that, that was very modest, but at least in concept shows it's possible. But for, for non enantial selective reactions, we see the potential is quite high. I've listed the zeolites here for the potential is modest because I'm, I'm talking about going to chiral synthesis. The problem with the zeolite, of course, is that creating the material in the first place is an enormous problem. And uh, because it's a crystal material, it's going to put a lot of limitations on the types of structures that, that you're going to be able to produce. So there, there really isn't you know, the, the, the real material that you'd like to have that is general and robust at this point. But there's a lot of progress made in, in each of these subcategories. Now, finally, for the last two slides, is the other point that I mentioned to you is could we build known structures, for example, but with precise atomic placements? Let me just illustrate why you might want to do that. This is a very interesting molecule that people have been made for quite a long time. It's 4 4 pine biphenol. The top is the way it's made now. You have to protect with T butanol groups. You couple, then you deprotect. It's a very expensive process to do this. Uh, work on zeolites now, primarily in Dow, but other places, is do alkylation in the, in the, the para para position, and do the standard chemistry that's done for cumene to clip it off to the 4 4 prime. It looks very nice. If you look at enzymes, enzyme can take biphenyl to biphenyl directly. Of course, the yields on this are, are exceedingly low, but that would be a very nice reaction to just do it in one step. I just showed you that, in fact, with TS1, that you can take aromatics and hydroxylate these directly with hydrogen peroxide. So could you build a zeolite, a titanium zeolite, to do this reaction? You might want to build, for example, a, a structure-directing agent that would be somewhat similar in size and shape. And, and would it organize the titanium in the right positions? There's some 
um, belief that it would based on how the other titanium zeolites are made, but you're leaving this up to Mother Nature, so probably it won't work. Um, but the chances are you could do something like this. But it's just not going to put those, those heteroatoms where you want them, I think, with any kind of consistency. So the approach that we took here to trying to move in this direction is let's go back to what we know about the synthetic mechanism. We know that these organics organize silicates and, and other inorganic oxides around themselves. So now the question was, what if we in fact covalently attach an atom that we would like to have in the framework directly onto the organic? Will this atom then be implanted into the final framework? If it is, then since the organic goes in an ordered fashion, that atom has to go in an ordered fashion. And in fact, you can do this. So this is our approach to try to put atoms where we want them in structures. So the idea is, in general, not only with silicon, but with other things, hook that atom onto the structure directing agent, crystallize the material so that you can implant that atom in there. And we've been successful in doing this for several cases now. Um, and so we'd like to see if we can actually uh, prove now. We have not proven that these are going to crystallographically in any site. We've just shown that they're in the framework. It's a lot harder to prove that they're only in one on site and we're working on that. So to finish, what I'd like to say is that you know, shape selective catalysis has come a long, long way since the first paper of Paul Weiss in 62. Um, it's no longer limited to acid or metal mediated catalysis or the combination thereof, but now you're seeing base catalysis come as well as the oxidation is coming very, very quickly. This TS4 <coughs> chemistry is enormously broad. I think shape selective Chiral synthesis is on the horizon. Um, I don't see, although it's a really fun problem and a tough one, I don't see that there's going to be too much applicability for this. This is going to be a very specialized area, uh, not so much as the, the types that you see in the first bullet. But I think where people are thinking about now is, is that we're trying to think more about transition state selectivity rather than reactant or product shape selectivity. We're actually trying to go at the transition state and we're trying to construct, construct these new materials. And so this, this says that we have to do two things right. We not only have to get the geometry right, but we have to get the placement of the catalytically active element right with the geometry. So we have to get both of them correct. We have to get the structure and the atomic arrangement correct to be able to do this. But this will be where the real big payoffs will be for very highly selective materials. And so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to end by, by thanking all of the brilliant students that have been in our lab over the last 15 years, and the funding agencies that allowed us to, to, to have fun doing this, primarily NSF, as Dick mentioned, and uh, the government, and uh, for the companies, it's been Dow in the early years, and, and uh, Chevron and OXO in the later years. Thanks for your attention. Please join me in thanking Mark Davis for a very I suppose I should make an announcement, but I think it's time for the...